and welcome to Crushing Doubts Q&A. Same time every week, Mondays, 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. I am uh, very excited to be joined once again by all of you and looking forward to discussing all of the things that we can and, and want to about mind-body issues. So as usual, as we're getting started, we're going to jump in with a preloaded question because otherwise we may not get to it at all. In the meantime, I'm joined by Catherine Toomer on YouTube. Vasco has joined me on uh, Instagram, as has Lucy. Good to see you all. And I expect we're going to be joined by a number of other people. So uh, I'll jump right in with questions. Then I'll pause for a little bit to make some announcements about what's going on at this time. Uh, and we'll take it from there. Okay, this is from Joni M. She said, my core narrative has been working when I'm awake. I just wondered how it can crush, how I can crush, I think it was I can crush the doubt was meant to be said, uh, in the unconscious. Okay, so this is an important question. I, I get a lot of questions about awake and uh, asleep questions, and they are they are certainly are different. Um, so the difference between awake and asleep, aside from the obvious, of course, is it, it really is a very different operating system. I say this to people all the time that when you are asleep, you are much more likely to be affected by your emotions column. The emotions are still churning. Your mind is still working. Uh, doubt and fear can also be active in the unconscious. But what I do is I look for the patterns to determine which column is active here. Now, Joni's question is, you know, the core narrative is really helping when she's awake. How can she get it to go into the, the unconscious time period? Well, first of all, Joni, I want to encourage you. It's only a matter of time. The more you work at it, the more... Um, integrated the core narrative becomes to who you are. And the more integrated it is, the more likely it is to really be able to penetrate that unconscious state. I mean, really, when it comes down to it, my power column is now really a part of how I think about me almost all the time. I can get knocked out of it sometimes, but it's pretty rare. So what you want to do is just keep working to integrate it during the daytime hours. Eventually, that is going to get into the nighttime hours. One thing you could do, though, is right before you go to bed, take some time to think about the day and see how it fit in with your power column. Were you out of power for any reason? And, and really, try not to leave it there. It's kind of like, you know, the, the old adage, don't go to sleep angry. Don't go to sleep powerless either. Really important that you try to find a way to, to work towards your power to figure out a way forward that is going to be something that is useful for you. So that that's a huge part a part of it is to be more consciously attuned to things as you're going to bed, and then you can kind of take it from there. Okay, hi, Sylvia. Good to see you on YouTube. We've got uh, Retrospections Vintage has joined us on Instagram, and Scotty Styles saying hello on Instagram too. Good to see you, Scotty. All right, Sylvia has a question. When I get pain while teaching a class, I find I can't stop to ID the trigger or do much about it. Totally get it. Trying to ID a trigger or to address it, calm down, seems to make uh, maybe make it more stressful. Thoughts? Then, okay, let's hold this up here, but I'm going to read the second part of her comment, but hold, leave this question part up if you don't mind, Courtney. Thanks. She then says, I'm leaning towards trying to stay indifferent when pain strikes while teaching and to just try to address it afterwards, since trying to manage it or address it while teaching doesn't seem helpful. First of all, I totally get it, Sylvia, and it really is true. You've got to find a solution that's going to work for you. It's not going to be easy necessarily to stop, and you know, you're not going to like break out your mind-body map and be like, "What's happening here?" While you're teaching, obviously, you can't do that, uh, or very unlikely that you could. But what you can do is is slowly but surely develop the system, the, the systems that work for you. So you actually might find that there are certain things that you can do while you're teaching to. Um, to kind of multitask the problem, uh, I, I've, it's funny because I was meeting with uh, the group, the membership group today, and I was talking about how multitasking is a little bit misunderstood when it comes to the mind-body ideology because you really want to be unitasking. You want to focus on, on what am I specifically doing. But in the outside world, you've you got to multitask about other things. You've got to be doing other things. So try. We're, we could work to try to find some very small solutions for you. One would just be, um, you know, indifference is one thing, but you could say to yourself, this, this could change. This will, cha this will change moment to moment. Just that, even, even reminding yourself of that, 
that's a little bit of a different strategy than just indifference. So I want you just to try to find different strategies that don't take much time because you don't have much time. IDing a trigger, yeah, doesn't work at that time, generally speaking. You could say to yourself, okay, I'm going to address this right after the class. Just by storing that in your mind that you're going to do that, as long as you can remember, it puts it in a place. So there's all kinds of different ways. But yes, uh, you're asking very important questions. And I think ultimately when it comes down to it, you don't want to do anything that's going to make it more stressful. And that includes using the system. If using the columns is putting pressure on you, take a break from it. You do not need to be doing it at every moment. So that, that's that's my primary thought, Sylvia. But on top of it, we can develop some systems in between little little things you can do that can give you some wiggle room or maybe things you can do. Uh, so follow-up questions, bring them so we can keep working on this problem. Thanks, Sylvia. Okay, Patty, Patty Martin saying hi on YouTube. Good to see you, Patty. And Carl Carrick, uh, or, or is it Carl Carl K, I think, has joined us on, on uh, Instagram. Good to see you all. We actually have time for another preloaded question. I can't believe it. Let's bring it up. Okay, oh, this is an observation, not a question, but one that I thought to highlight. This is from Bob. He said, my A questions are fluid and dynamic. So actually, before I even get into this, let's leave this up here. He is referring to the idea that I've brought up of A and B questions. Eventually, as I worked with people, I realized that I was telling people to ask any and all questions, and you should still do that. But one thing to, to keep in mind is that some questions are more helpful than others. Asking the question is helpful anyway, but you need to identify is it what I call an A question or a B question? An A question is designed to further your information, to get you closer to your goal of understanding and feeling clear about things. It, it's a question that is designed to get you answers. A B question, by, uh, by contrast, is actually meant to confuse. It is crafted by doubt. This is one of the ways that doubt gets in, is it crafts B questions puts them into our mouths and then we ask them and suddenly we're doubting ourselves in, in some way. So Bob is referring to A questions in that, in that concept. He said, my A questions are fluid and dynamic. They keep changing and the answers change as well. I keep doing the columns, then go back and compare with column work done before. This is starting to show me how I'm beginning to see the process. Okay, so I did want to show this because this is an example of um, somebody who's starting to it's starting to click for them some, but mostly he's building on his successes. He's noticing when he goes back and looks, he has made progress. And sometimes we are going to need to take a step back and say, no, have I made progress? Doubt is going to convince you you have not made progress. It's very frequently just going to get you to say, well, I still have symptoms and I still have this. And suddenly you're talking yourself into you've made no progress. A questions are incredibly important, um, and I, I like his observation that they're fluid and dynamic, and they keep changing. Same with me. I mean, my system keeps growing because I keep having questions, and I keep wanting to find out more, and I keep finding ways to make sense of it that fit with everything. So keep up the good work, Bob. I'm glad you are finding that these A questions are really helping you. And I can see you're, you're kind of in the flow of things. When you're asking A questions and feeling good about it, it definitely moves the, moves the needle. Okay, Sylvia says, thanks, Dan. Those ideas are really helpful and I will try them out. I jotted them down. Great, Sylvia. Um, those are the kind of solutions you want in, in those moments. You just want very quick hitting things because when you don't have time for it, you don't have time for it, but you can always remember, okay, even just saying something to yourself like, remember the one assumption I make sense and my symptoms make sense. I'll make sense of this later. It's not going to last forever. This is just a moment. Eventually, you'll get a better at, I, I feel funny using this word now that I was talking about unitasking, <laughs> doing one task at a time, even though I don't know if that's even a word. But it really is the case that ultimately you will get good at multitasking, meaning doing this, this system at the same time as you're living your life. Okay, it looks like we have a comment coming in from Facebook. Okay, this is from Wolf Bowden, uh, and he says, Dan, could you please refresh the idea of the core narrative? Thanks. Okay, so the idea of the core narrative is um, essentially it is a way of knowing who you are in a very clear, crystallized way, but 
it is not who you are across the board. We have many identities in our lives, many ways that we are. The way I think about the core narrative is it is your, it is the core of your suffering self. How have you most suffered in your life? What is that actually about? And how do we describe it? Okay, so that's the basic gist of the core narrative. But now I'll break it down in terms of what it actually is. It is three sentences that are meant to describe yourself in that way. The first is, what is the essence of your suffering? What is the main way that you've suffered? If you could pick one thing or maybe two, you want to try to get that into one sense. And you want it to be broad, high stakes, and also have some specifics to it. But in the core narrative, mostly focus on broad and high stakes. What are the broad and high stakes ways that you have suffered? That's the first sentence. The second sentence can get more specific because that is where you ask the question, how did it affect you? How did it impact you? Did it lead you to isolate? Did it make you feel like an outsider? Did it make you feel suicidal? Did it make you depressed? Did it make you angry? Did it actually make you thrive in some ways? How did it affect you? And that's the second sentence. The third sentence is, what are you going to do to live differently? And so the, the first two sentences map out what's been happening for you all along, whereas the third sentence is a chance to start to think about, how can I do this differently? So, Wolf, let's have some follow-up as needed, but I uh, hope that answers your question. Okay, I see a Sensible Goddess Coaching has joined us on Instagram. Good to see you here again. And uh, Napoleon... Vegas has joined us. Okay, there are two parts to this. The first one, hi, Dan. I hope that you're doing great. I am, thank you. Question, how can I be a perfectionist in a way that doesn't flare up the symptoms? I try to enjoy the moment every time, but sometimes I found myself mad when I'm doing something that I know that I can enjoy most of the time, mad and with symptoms. Okay, let's leave this up here. A couple of things to address in there. So, I want to tell you guys something about the way that I think about this because I'm a perfectionist too. I really am. I, there's no way around it. You know, I wish wish I could say otherwise, but um, I'm not that it's bad. But I think that the the gist here is that you don't you're not required to be a different person than you are. Actually, that, that's an important part of something that I've come to in the columns work because I had that question. People ask me that question all the time. I ask myself that question. Do I just need to change how I am? And part of what I realized, and this, this has come from a lot of investigation and um, thinking about things on, on my part in my own life, let alone in, in working with other people, I've come to see that really we don't need to change. It's more that we need to accept who we are. The power column is all about that, accepting the fullness of your trauma, uh, being fiercely in your own corner. This is all about accepting who we are. So with a perfectionist, it's the same. It's not that you need to change being a perfectionist. It's actually that we want to have perfectionism applied in the right way. So let me get back to the question now. How can I be a perfectionist in a way that doesn't flare up the symptoms? Okay. So if you're being a perfectionist in a way that flares up the symptoms, one of the things that it suggests is that you're not actually happy about what you're doing. You're trying to be a perfectionist, but some part of you is objecting to it, saying, hey, this is too much, or I don't like this. Uh, whereas if you are being a perfectionist, but it's perf perfectly in flow, you could feel great. I mean, even on even in this very um, look, I'm I'm stumbling for words, and the perfectionist in me and th is thinking, "Oh my God, I shouldn't be stumbling for words." What I really like though is I can return to being perfect in a certain way, and the way that I can be perfect here is not caring. That's actually part of being a perfectionist. So I channel who I am into what's happening. Napoleon, when you're asking, how can I be a perfectionist in a way that doesn't flare up the symptoms, I would say it this way. You want to be a perfectionist in a way that aligns with who you are. Don't be a perfectionist in ways that are meant to please other people or are giving yourself a hard time. That will lead to symptom flares. Be in flow with yourself. Live in the power column. Figure out what's in alignment with you. Okay, now this second half, he said, I try to enjoy the moment every time. We can't always enjoy the moment, though. Sometimes you are criticizing yourself for not enjoying the moment, and that's going to make the moment even less enjoyable. So let yourself have the moment you have. You know, it's like breathing is a big part of it. Just take a deep breath. Remind yourself that you are allowed that breath. You're allowed to be you. 
you're allowed to be however you want to be. Uh, now you were saying, but sometimes I found myself mad when I'm doing something that I know that I can enjoy most of the time, mad with the symptoms. And I do understand that. But remember, the power column is all about the symptoms are communicating something to you. So focus on the communication, on the value of the communication. I, I, I get why you wouldn't like the symptoms. But if you've got the column system, you can get rid of these, these symptoms because they describe what it's all about. And once you understand it, you won't have the symptoms. Okay, Napoleon, hope, hope that was helpful. Okay, Bob is asking this question. Would keeping a 1 to 10 pain scale log be good for knowing where one is at with a symptom or would keeping the log reinforce the symptom? Okay, let's leave this up here too. This is a great question for multiple reasons. It's a good question just in and of itself, but it's also an example of a kind of question I want to talk about. This is a question that many people are asking, you know, is this thing good for me or not? And here's the thing. I say this all the time. You have to develop your system within my system. What that means is you, you need to know how the columns work in general, but you also need to know how they work for you. So my answer to you, Bob, on this one is that um, keeping a, a, you know, a pain scale log could be extremely helpful for one person and not helpful for another person. Not only that, it could be helpful to you at one moment and unhelpful to you at a, another moment. So I hate to say depends here, but it actually is really important to have depends in the mix because it, it all depends on what is driving the columns. If it is adding to your doubt and your fear and your questions and your confusion, then it's not going to help you. If it's reducing that, if it's allowing you to feel like, ah, I've got a system, it could be great. So it really depends on what's going on for you about it, Bob. Maybe you can share as a follow-up if you've tried that what that's been like for you. And I'm not sure if you were here earlier, Bob, but I believe that was your observation about noting the, some of the changes that you, you were finding with your A questions. So I, I brought that from before. If that was yours, I hope you don't mind that I use that. Okay, uh, Tusif Kyle is asking, can I ask your email address? And actually, um, yes, anybody who wants to get in touch with me, it's dan at crushingdoubt.org. Sometimes I actually find that I'm interacting with you guys on here and I wish that we could be in touch by email. <laughs> but I don't have your emails. So if you ever want to just have me have your email so that I can contact you if I have a thought that might be particularly helpful to you, send me an email at dan at crushingdoubt.org and you can just get linked up with me and that way we're all set up. So I'm going to pause for a second and talk about some of the things that are going on that can be helpful to all of you. I really have worked a lot, especially in the last year, um, but actually going back to when I was on... Um, the Curable podcast with John Strax, I realized how many systems need to get in place. And I've built these systems out. And now I feel like I'm at a really good place with these, these systems. And I don't just mean the column system. I also mean the seminars, the membership groups, the referrals, my training programs. I do train people. So if people are interested in learning about this and want to do this work, please do contact me and let me know. We're going to start up another training round in January. We have a seminar going on now. It started today, so we're in day one. You can always catch up. Uh, send me an email, dan at crushingdoubt.org, or you can email Greg, because Greg gets it set up directly, greg at crushingdoubt.org, and you can join us for that. If not, there will be another one coming uh, fairly soon. We usually do one every six weeks or so. The membership groups, meanwhile, are just rolling. They're there always. I'm finding they're incredibly useful. They give everybody an opportunity to process what's going on uh, for them in the moment. They're cost-effective, they're affordable, and they also actually do good things for me because they allow me to have a way to get back to people very quickly instead of being bogged down in emails and um, not having the, the exchange happen fast enough. Because remember, this is moment-to-moment -moment experience. So we want to really get in there. We want to dig in in the moments and figure out what's happening. And the best way to do it is to have some ongoing interaction. The membership groups are just outstanding for that. So if you want the link to that, it's on our website, www.crushingdoubt.org, but you can also contact me or Greg, either one at crushingdoubt.org. Okay, Carrie Nordling, good to see you on Instagram, and Michelle, you too. Okay, we have a question coming in from Catherine Toomer, and she was working on plantar fasciitis and which I said is always mind-body. So I'm going to pull up a question on this. Although it looks like 
we're in the middle of that. Catherine, were you typing more of that? Because it looks like you trailed off on that. I'll get started anyway, and then you can jump in if, if I miss something. She said, my plantar fasciitis is still here, but I'm still largely trusting, and it has been inconsistent enough to support the mind-body diagnosis. Good. But this week, I had what I think was a stomach virus. I'm sorry to hear that. As I'm recuperating, I'm thinking that the nausea is going away too slowly for a normal three-day kind of thing. Uh, then you said, my, but it trailed off. So I'll make a comment on this, and then we can you know, talk more, Catherine, as we go. Uh, now, in my experience, uh, most GI things really are very, very mind-body focused. That's certainly not always going to be the case. You can have GI responses to all kinds of things, but it tends to be a pretty sensitive um, part of, of your mind-body experience that tends to respond very quickly, just like pain does, actually. These are some of the reasons these are very common ones. And one thing you're going to need to look out for is doubt shifting around looking for a new symptom. And that may be what happened here. In fact, I'm hearing that it's got you in a doubt phase, that maybe it's going on longer than it should. And interestingly, you could you could either be doubting that, oh, maybe something is more seriously wrong, which I'm almost positive it's not, but see a doctor if you're worried, or the opposite direction. It could be that you are recognizing, aha, this is a sign that this is my body. And that's going to give you more confidence. Now, it's never fun to have those symptoms. And of course, you guys know me and my phobia, so that's the last symptom I want to have. Um, but I think the key here is to keep building confidence, to keep building up your columns and feeling like you know where you're going and you feel good about uh, where you're headed and how to understand it. Okay, Jasper, good to see you on Instagram as well. All right, Sylvia has an observation. Uh, she's actually talking to Bob here um, in response to the pain scale, I believe. So Sylvia said, listen to Dan and do what is best for you. I also wanted to mention that there are a series of three studies in Howard Schubiner's book that showed that keeping pain journals made things worse. Okay, interesting. So again, it's really going to depend on the person. Um, if, it, if it builds a sense of confidence... And it builds a sense of confidence in the mind-body experience overall in, in general. That's, that's what I'm talking about. It's going to bring down symptoms. I, I would probably tend to agree with Sylvia that on, on par, keeping a pain scale log is maybe more likely for most people to... It's, it's like the reverse of attentional TMS we're, when we're trying to get the attention off the symptoms. For many people, I think keeping a pain scale would keep their mind on the symptoms, but that's not true for everybody. So Bob, it, again, it depends on what's going on for you. Okay, follow up on uh, what Catherine Duma was saying. She said, my husband asked how much of this I thought was mind body. I was wondering the same since I have a 20 year history with chronic nausea. Okay, but I had overcome most of it through mind body. Then I wondered if the whole episode was mind-body, even though it acted so much like a flu. Okay. So, Catherine, in terms of it acting like a flu, I don't know if that means that you were achy and had a fever and stuff like that. Um, if that's the case, you know, it's possible that it was uh, related to a particular flu, but then you'd have to think about, well, was I, was I potentially exposed to someone? You know, in today's day and age where we're not going out that much, maybe it's not likely but maybe you did happen to see people. Either way, I will tell you this, and this comes from my experience with my phobia, nausea is very, very connected to mind-body. Um, I've been able to control it for decades because I have to, because it bothers me that much. And I wouldn't be, have been able to if it were not uh, such a mind-body experience. If you think about it too, it's a, it's a sign of disgust. It's connected to something where we're upset about something usually. So really interesting to consider. Now, Catherine says, and having my husband suggest the mind-body aspect should have felt good, but it didn't because it seems as though I can never be legitimately sick. Oh, wow. We were supposed to be doing things and I needed, I'm reading, I'm reading too fast for your typing. I'm sorry, Catherine. I'll let you catch up and then I'll get to that. But let me address that next, that first sentence that you gave. Oh, okay. Here we go. We were supposed to be doing things and I needed to rest, but maybe if it's mind body, I don't need to get to rest, especially in my husband's eyes. Any thoughts? 
Uh, sorry to mention the one th- uh, thing that is particularly difficult for you. No, no problem, Catherine. I'm here for everything, including the things I don't want to talk about. Um, one thing I want to say to you, Catherine, here, and this is a pretty key point for all of you. This is a, a very power column idea. Um, the idea is that you don't need to feel sick to have permission to rest. You could just need to rest. And that's, I mean, think how freeing that could be. You know, a lot of the power column is about freeing yourself up, freeing yourself up to recognize, you know what, I don't need to have a symptom to rest or to say, I don't want to do this or to say, I want time to myself. The power column is about giving yourself permission to do what you want. So the fact that you're worried about, okay, would you be able to get to rest? What would your husband think, Catherine? This is totally normal. I'm not saying it critically at all, but I think you want to think about, you know, if you're going to be fiercely in your own corner, as I say, wouldn't it be great to give yourself full permission to rest whenever you need to rest? In other words, a mind-body condition, as opposed to being, quote-unquote, actually sick, doesn't make any difference. It is still you telling you, I need a break. I need to rest. So try to be kinder to yourself with that interpretation. To me, they're they're really no different. Uh, in fact, most of them are actually mind-body experiences anyway, all these times that people were supposedly sick. Uh, even though there are germs, remember, um, mind-body experience can bring down the immune system. So there's something going on usually that leads to any kind of illness. Okay, Bob uh, says on YouTube, I like to see where I'm, where I'm at but didn't want to reinforce any symptom. Thank you for your thoughts, Dan and Sylvia. Okay, so, but Bob, remember, it depends on what's working for you. We, I don't want to get in the way of something that is working for you. So liking to see where you're at, that's a perfect example. What you're describing there sounds like it might be good because you're saying, if I'm, if I'm using the mind-body experience and it's getting better and I'm seeing the numbers go down, that's convincing to me. See how it can be totally good for some people? You've been tracking, Bob, and you've been seeing results, and it's been working. So whatever you're doing, don't stop doing it. You know, that, this is the, your system that you're finding within my system. Keep it up. You know, I'm, I'm, not to take away from anything that um, I was saying or Sylvia was saying, um, including her saying listening to me. This is the thing I want to point out to you. You're all different. And you, what works for you may not work for another person. That's okay. Find the things that work for you. Okay, Jasper has uh, Jasper Hitchcock has a question on Instagram, or maybe it's an observation. Let's see. I have been mixing what you and Dr. Uh, Dispenza, that's Joe Dispenza, preach. It's working. Awesome. Crushing and meditating my doubts away. Okay, so Joe Dispenza has some really, really interesting books. For anybody who hasn't read him, um, you know, he's one of these people where I found that I integrated certain parts from him into the way that I was thinking about things. I don't integrate everything. You know, my system works the way I feel like my system works. So I don't build meditation into my system necessarily, but I do use it. I meditate. And Joe Dispenza not only uses meditation, but he also uh, looks at scans of the brain while people are meditating to get information about that. He's doing great work with it. He's shown all kinds of changes can happen. Meanwhile, Joe Dispenza has a really fascinating story. For those of you who don't know, he was run over um, by a car, broke his back, was told he would never walk again, and he used his mind to work back from that. It's a fascinating story and really inspiring. So, um, you know, check it out. My favorite one of his is You Are the Placebo, which is basically about how you can start to unleash your power within the mind-body experience as long as you believe things you know, strongly. And that's where I, I tend to think the best way for me to believe is through science and logic. People believe in all sorts of ways, but find a way to believe. And for me, that's about science and logic. Jasper, you're, you're utilizing different sources and bringing it together in a way that works for you. This is part of your system within my system. So keep up the good work. That's fantastic. Okay, I actually have time for another preloaded question. I don't know what's going on tonight. Uh, let's see. This is from Ryan. Okay. Oh, and we also have another a follow up from from Wolf um, on Facebook. So Wolf, I'll get to you in a second. 
Uh, we're going to bring Ryan's question in here first. Sometimes I'll get skin rashes that I know are mind body. It's not distracting or even that annoying. Why does the brain even bother? Other symptoms trouble me much more at the same time. Okay. So uh, let's leave this up there just so I can think about it as I'm answering it. But the question essentially is if something's not distracting and it's not even that annoying, why is it there? Well, here's the thing, Ryan, this to me is a good piece of evidence for the fact that the, what I call the emotions column isn't everything. And Sarno, much as I love him, he talked about the uh, symptoms distracting from emotional life. He's not wrong about that. It's just that that's just a part of the picture. So why does it do these things if it's not distracting or not that annoying? Well, this is where I want to remind you that it's also a communication. Sometimes the brain is communicating something to you through a mind-body symptom that you didn't know about. And if it's very mild, essentially it's expressing some kind of mild annoyance. I've made reference to this before, but it really is true. I don't even sneeze without being slightly irritated. In fact, I tend to be slightly irritated when, I'm, when I then have to sneeze. So if I ever sneeze in front of you, it doesn't mean I'm annoyed at you, but it does probably mean I'm annoyed about something. <laughs> and that's okay. I like to be transparent about it. I think we want to move past this mind-body stuff where we can be transparent. But if I'm more, more annoyed, I tend to have a stronger symptom. So what I'm hearing, Ryan, in this is your brain is expressing some kind of mild irritation. The symptom tends to mirror the level to which you're upset. So uh, try to think about it this way. We are always expressing ourselves in multiple ways. One of the ways that we express ourselves is in mind-body symptoms. And to me, every symptom is expressing something, even if it's minor. And I use that as information. Okay, we're going to jump to Wolf's question from Facebook. Um, he had this question. How can I crush fear and despair that arise when symptoms ramp up? Okay. Um, so Wolf, this is a broad, this is a broad question you're asking, which means I'm going to give you an answer, but it's probably going to require follow-up, which is fine with me, but you keep it coming. Um, first of all, what I say to people is that the columns help to structure your way of understanding mind-body experience. But within that, we have to help you get used to articulating what's going on for you specifically. So when you say, how can I crush fear and despair that arise when symptoms ramp up? What I usually say to people in this kind of situation is, okay, well, you're clearly working in the doubt column um, because fear is a form of doubt. It's the emotional form of doubt. So it could creep over into the other column some, but first and foremost, we've got to get the fear and the doubt under control. Despair, by the way, is a form of doubt. It is the doubt that things can get better that they can be okay. I'm not saying it's not its own thing also, but it's helpful to think of that as a form of doubt. Doubt creeps in in all sorts of ways. What you want to do is just like anybody else, Wolf, you want to articulate these doubts much more specifically. What are you afraid of? What are you despairing of? What are you saying to yourself? What questions do you have? What confusion do you have? Get it articulated. Write it all down on a sheet of paper. And then bring all those questions. Bring them to the Q&A even. We'll, we'll, we'll just tear through them all. Get them articulated and then work with science and logic to get them addressed. Sometimes people need reassurance, by the way. This is another thing that the membership groups and even the seminars are particularly useful for. I come in against doubt very strongly. I'm a very good ally against doubt. If you want to uh, join them, just let me know. It's dan at crushingdoubt.org or you can contact my uh, business partner, Greg, greg at crushingdoubt.org, and he can get you set up. But the main issue here, Wolf, is to get it more specific now. We've located we're in the doubt column. Now let's get more specific, articulate those doubts. If you can actually counter them in a way where you believe the counter, you won't be afraid. You know, you'll have the right information. It'll be settled within you. There are other ways too. Power column is another way you can address things like that. But let's start there, Wolf, and let me know if you need more information on that. Okay, <clears throat> we have another one coming in from Facebook, and then um, Sylvia. Actually, let me let me um, get to Sylvia's observation first. Sylvia said, "Sorry to confuse you, Bob. 
Uh, personally, I stopped logging the symptoms after doing it for so long, like two years at least, without seeing any real benefit from it. But if it helps you, that's different. So Sylvia, I want to be, um, it's funny. I'm just telling you how I think about these things. I'm feeling protective of you <laughs> because I don't want you to feel that you did anything wrong because you didn't. You were voicing something that actually may have helped many people out there. This is one thing we have to remember. Everything we say could help some people and could raise doubts in others. We've got to be able to speak freely, but I think that at the same time, it's really good to recognize different things work for different people. Sylvia is recognizing that. We shouldn't feel so beholden to each other in this. What we want to do is remember, you get to decide what works for you. Think about it. There's nothing wrong with the fact that what works for one person doesn't work for the other. It doesn't mean that thing doesn't work. It means that thing works for that one person, but not the other person. So Sylvia, just wanted to be a little protective of you because I didn't want you attacking yourself. And at the same time, isn't it great that some things work for some people, some things work for others, but even better, I can describe why. It's not just random. All right, Al Barris has joined us. Good to see you here, Al. Uh, he says, thanks for making these. I just started reading a Sarno book and watching your podcast. I'm finally able to enjoy things that I thought for years I couldn't do. Learning how doubt hurts me. I think you are continuing that statement, so we'll get to that more. But first, let me say, Al, I'm thrilled. I'm always thrilled when I hear about somebody healing and feeling better, whether it's working with me or not. To me, the fact that we can conquer these mind-body issues is a complete revelation. It has been a revelation in my life. I love bringing that to other people. So people who, I, I just got an email from somebody you know, saying how great Sarno was. And they like my podcast, but they're, they've been paying free since reading Sarno. That's great. Whatever got you there, you know, and the mind-body experience, there's, there's a lot of great writings out there that I've incorporated in my work and Sarno is very chief among them. So um, Al, keep, uh, keep writing more if you were going to write more or I'll double back and um, comment on the last part, if not. Okay, Amy, good to see you on Facebook. She said... Uh, Dan, with respect to keeping a pain scale log, that could be looked at as a mind-body log as well. Ah, good, good point. I'm going to say more about that in a second. On the high pain level days, could one not look at what may have happened that day to have caused the pain from a mind-body perspective and use it to better help to analyze things? Great observation, Amy. This shows you how it, this shows you why it works for some people. Amy's giving an example of why a mind-body log might work for maybe her or for some other people. It's a tracking device. For some people, tracking is good. And I'm not saying this is, you know, bad, Amy, on the other side. I'm just showing the other side. Then there are some people who they can't get their mind off the symptoms at all. And tracking it is something they're doing obsessively to try to help. But as it turns out, it doesn't end up helping. So it all depends on, you know, is it helping the person or not? Here's the way to answer that question, though, generally. Is it increasing your doubt or decreasing your doubt? Is it getting you further along in your ability to understand what's happening or is it, is it setting you back? In, in some ways, it's as simple as that. But great observation, Amy. Thanks for saying that. Okay. Uh, Bob said, Sylvia, I'm good. I liked your help. All right, good. So, Sylvia, good work. Thanks. All right, Napoleon says, speaking of Sarno, a year ago I found his work... Um, my, let's see, hold on. My uh, Something about your thumb. Sorry, there's a word in there I wasn't understanding. And carpal tunnel were totally uh, healed after reading the My Body Prescription. I just wanted to share that. Okay, thanks, Napoleon. Sarno's works, as I've said many times, they're really masterpieces. I, that doesn't mean they are right about everything or they cover all of the ground necessarily, but Dr. Sarno is one of my absolute all-time heroes. He might even be number one. He just, the guy saved my life. I mean, I had eight years of back pain and, and he, he cared so much that when he was talking to people, he worked on figuring this out. And um, I admire him. I carry myself very much in the tradition of Dr. Sarno in many ways. And it's part of how I got on to the idea of doubt. Uh, I don't think he carried it far enough, and I'm not saying that critically, but one thing that I saw, um, and there's a, a therapist um, who I am connected to and actually have trained in this work, but also had done a lot of mind-body work before even meeting me, 
uh, Liz Wallenstein, she um, she was pointing out to me that one of the things she likes about my system is that it deals with certainty in a way that really not not anyone has since Sarno in that way. I learned that from Sarno. I soaked it up. I realized what was working for me. It was an absolute godsend that he was that certain. And I knew, well, I need to be that certain too. To do that though, to be that certain, I knew I needed to think about these things a lot. So that's what I've done and that's what I will keep doing. Okay, Al, it looks like you um, have finished your, your thought or continuing with another thought. So you were saying that you had read a Sarno book and you're doing much better and you've been watching the podcast, which seems to have helped as well. And then you said, learning how doubt hurts me. Um, I think you were saying at the time, I'm learning how doubt hurts you. And that's incredibly important. It's something that I do feel was missing from the Sarno books and missing uh, in the mind-body community in certain ways. A lot of people do make reference to it or seem to be saying something like it. But one thing I like about my system is it comes directly out and says, look at what it does and look at how it operates and look what you can do to stop it. So we'll keep working at it. Then Al says, I've always been proud of my self-awareness, but now I'm realizing when my thoughts shift to being analytical about myself and doubting my abilities, it hurts my back. Great point, Al. So let's think about it this way. A lot of the good qualities we have, as goodest, as self-aware people, as people who are very thoughtful, as people who are analytical, these are all good qualities, but they can be used against us. You know, anything can be used against us in the mind-body uh, experience. Some of our greatest strengths go against us. Empathy is a great example of that. I'm a very empathic person, but it can sometimes lead me to make decisions that are for the other person more than me. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing across the board. Altruism is good. Caring about each other is good. Making sacrifice sometimes can be good, but sometimes it can go too far. So yes, even something like self-awareness can be one of the things that holds us back. In fact, on my troubleshooting um, PDF, and by the way, those mind-body guides are all available on www.crushingdoubt.org. Um, and in addition, I just updated the action steps and uh, troubleshooting PDFs. So if you bought those and you want the update, I'm giving those for free. So just let me know. Send me an email, dan at crushingdoubt.org, or send, send it to Greg and he'll get you set up, greg at crushingdoubt.org. But one of the things I mentioned in that troubleshooting document is that very self-aware people can sometimes run into the troubleshooting spots. So Al, I think you're observing that. I want to encourage you about something though. You don't need to change how you are at all. These are great qualities you have, but being aware of that is going to help you because then it will help you develop new action steps to say, you know what? This is a moment where I'm going to turn off self-analysis. This is a moment where I'm not going to be as self-aware or at least not as focused on it and give myself a chance to have a rest from that. Okay, let's see if we have any other questions. Um, all right, we can get another preloaded question in here. We're, we're on a roll with these. Um, this is from Diane, Diane L. Could you discuss the role of complex PTSD and mind-body symptoms? Uh, okay, well, this is interesting. Sometimes I read a question and I think, oh, wow, I'm not sure we have time for that that one because it's got so much to it. So complex PTSD and mind-body symptoms, it does have a lot to it. I'm going to give a brief answer, but I'm going to leave this in the Q&A and maybe pick up with it next time. So complex PTSD, let's talk about what that is. First of all, uh, PTSD is post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome uh, or disorder. Um, and I'm not a big believer in the idea of disorders and syndromes, but I do believe that PTSD is describing something very real where we get knocked into trauma, something that was very, very upsetting. It can be what's known as capital T trauma versus lowercase t trauma, meaning, you know, capital T trauma might be like having been uh, in a situation at war where you could have lost your life or being raped, things like that that are so dramatic. And then there's lowercase t trauma where it might not be necessarily traumatic to everybody, but it really was to you. Here's a good example of it for me. Um, when I was adopted uh, by my stepfather, that was interestingly both a very happy experience and a happy day. And also, it had some lowercase t trauma for me. 
because I had to change my last name. I had to go back to school the next day as like somebody else. It felt really messed up. <laughs> That's lowercase d trauma. So complex PTSD is when you have more than one of those or multiple experiences like that. And so just in brief, and we'll wrap up on this, that does tend to lead to a lot more symptoms. Trauma leads to symptoms. One thing to think about is to, um, to start to think about trauma as something that you're trying to process and your mind-body process is working that out. It's expressing what happened there. It's expressing what the trauma is, trying to get you to understand it. In the power column, we're trying to accept the fullness of the trauma and get to that core narrative so you can feel, okay, that happened, yes. But it doesn't have to dominate me anymore. Before you get to that, it does tend to dominate, especially through mind-body symptoms. Okay, one last uh, comment. This is from Patty Martin. Great to see you here, Patty. As always, she said, I found Dr. Sarno's book was great, but it didn't explain how to implement all that great information. For me, I needed more, and Crushing Doubt is helping me. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Patty. That's very kind of you to say, but also really gratifying because I know it's true. I know that you have found that. I know a lot of people have found that. It's, you know, when I read Sarno and I wanted to give back to, to the, the sufferers out there and make sure that they didn't suffer in the way that I did, one thing I knew is we needed something on how to implement it. And I had to think and think and think about these things and test things out. And now I'm getting to have the, the very fun and gratifying experience of bringing it all to you now that it's pretty fully baked. So thanks so much, guys. It is a pleasure as always. I will be here next week. Uh, that's December 13th, Monday, 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. The following week, December 20th, I am out from the q and I'm going to be away on a, a family trip, so I won't be available then. But I will be back the following week, and I look forward to uh, continuing our questions. You can always send me questions as well, preloaded questions, if you can't be here. Again, dan at crushingdoubt.org, and we'll keep working at it. Thanks so much, guys. It is a pleasure, and I will see you next week.